So the big advance in, in CPUs through the 1990s was this concept of pipelining. This is another kind of parallelization. In SIMD, you're just doing copies of an instruction. Pipelining means you're going to run multiple instructions at the same time in different phases. It's somewhat like a production line. Imagine we've got four workers at once. The conveyor belt is moving towards the camera, and they're all helping to, to make stuff. The, the thing they're making is like, like the instructions. So we talked last time about the function of a CPU being broken down into stages, often called fetch, decode, execute. You can also consider additional stages. So the writing back, sending stuff back out to memory can be viewed as another stage. In a modern Intel chip, they consider 37 stages, I think. They break, break each execution down into all of those stages. And so the idea is each of these workers on the production line is working simultaneously with the others, and they're each working on a different instruction. Imagine the instructions of your program are flowing down the conveyor belt, and you have these stages of fetch, decode, execute, and write back, and there's someone doing each of those stages on different instructions all at the same time. Okay? So you'll often see diagrams like this that show the sequence of things that need to be done. Each instruction here has got four stages, fetch, decode, execute, write back in this case. And four of these, these stages can be done simultaneously. So there are four instructions all getting executed together and they're each in one of the four phases of execution. So the, the fetch person is doing fetch on the, actually it's this way around, this would be the fetch person, is doing fetch for the, the instruction furthest down the program, and the execution person is doing for the one first in the program. Now this, this works really well for things like multimedia applications, when you know that everything's going to go smoothly through what's called a pipeline. This process is called pipelining. You know that every chunk of digital video is going to have to be decoded in the same way. Someone's going to be fetching stuff and decoding it and executing it and writing to memory, and it goes very smoothly. There's not a whole load of conditional branching going on here. In a sense, there's not much computation. There's a lot of calculation, but not much computation because you don't have the, the ifs. When you have conditions in there, things can get a little bit nasty. Um, the pipeline can break, and there are some other ways it can break as well, which we will look at now. So, these breakages are known as hazards in the pipelining literature. Like a pipe, pipeline hazards, things that can go wrong with the pipeline system. So, again, what we have here is people at this end of the pipeline are doing the early stages, like fetching and decoding and execution. So this person is executing an if statement, okay? If it's a square widget, then paint it blue on the production line. The problem is these people are starting to execute the instructions after the if statement, okay? Um, and in this case, the pipeline's gone wrong because this worker's decided to start painting the thing red. This work has decided to go and fetch the red paint to enable her to paint it red. And it's only at this moment in time that this worker has got around to actually evaluating the content of the if statement. And we've discovered that actually we don't want to paint it red, we want to paint it blue. Okay, so we've wasted a, a bunch of work over here. Okay, this is called a branching hazard. You're, if your program doesn't have any branches in it, you can quite happily split this stuff up simultaneously. When there's a branch, you are risking the people further back in the pipeline taking the wrong branch. <coughs> they can't predict which way we're going to go because you haven't executed the, the if statement yet. Okay, then we have what are called data hazards. So this is if two parts of the pipeline are trying to use the same piece of data at the same time. So, for example, here, this worker is just beginning fetch on a new instruction. This worker is just finishing a previous instruction, okay? 
So in this case, the comput computation's been done. We're going to store the result in address 73, or shelf 73, on a, on a warehouse system. Um, and the next instruction in the program is going to read the result from address 73. And the problem with the pipeline is they're trying to do this both at the same time, and they're, they're going to collide. Okay? This is called a, a data hazard. Then we have what are called structural hazards, and these are to do with resources required by the instruction. You can have several instructions that need to use the same physical bit of the CPU to do something. They might both need to call the ALU or a, a subcomponent of the ALU. Um, and in more complex CPU designs, those facilities can be required by different parts of the fetch decode execute cycle. So for example here, this worker is processing an older instruction, which is doing a compare. She's ex executing a control command, and she needs to compare whether something equals zero. That's in one of these conditional branch instructions. But at the same time, someone further down the pipeline is starting a newer instruction, um, which requires some adding. So perhaps, perhaps this is part of a fetch command. And uh, in some architectures, you can specify a location you want to fetch as an addition. So you have to go and do some arithmetic over there as well. And both of these workers are going to try and grab the calculator at the same time. And you might only have one calculator. Okay. So we've got branching hazards. This is when you have an if. We have data hazards. It's when two instructions are hitting on the same address and memory at the same time. And we have structural hazards, where two instructions are needing the same resources at the same time. OK. John, you know when you say at the same time? Yeah. Uh, is it actually at the same time that these things are happening? Because I know when people say Yes, it's, it's physically at the same time. I don't mean concurrent, I mean simultaneous. So your CPU, it will have a, a fetching bit of Logisim stuff, a bunch yeah. of logic gates, and a decode bit, and an execute, and they are literally and physically running at the same time. Yeah, yeah. different concept from concurrency in operating systems where you're chopping things up and, and sharing your resources. Okay, thanks. Okay, so over the years, different approaches have been developed for managing these hazards or potential hazards. Um, we're going to look at some roughly in order of their complexity. So most basically, you can ask your users to write their code in ways that avoid it. Okay? For example, a data hazard can occur if you store something and then load it back in the next instruction. So you could just ask your users not to do that, or you could have a, a program that checks their assembly code and gives a warning if they try to do a, a store followed by a load. Um, Slightly more advanced version of that is to get compiler writers to do this. You could work with the compiler writers and make sure that nothing they generate automatically in Assembler is, is going to do that. Um, if you do have a case where a data hazard would occur, you work with the compiler writers and you get them to, to twiddle it a little bit. Sometimes you can change the order of instructions. If you have two instructions in your program that don't affect each other, then it's okay to swap them over. So you could work with compiler writers and make them swap some of their instructions so they're not creating things that, that give rise to hazards. Um, the kind of default option, the most basic option where no one really needs to do anything else is you just stall the pipeline. Uh, it's, it's called bubbling. If you see anything happening that could create a hazard, like an if instruction, you can just stall the pipeline. You tell all the workers to do nothing for one clock cycle. It's like having an empty space on your production line. And this, this is sometimes called a NOP for, for no operation. Okay? So imagine the workers on the line, and they've usually got jobs to do, and you're just going to put a, an empty space on the line. Um, this is somewhat undesirable because you're wasting time. Yeah? If you want to be using your, your workers as, as much as you can. So another option is to redo work. You can let the pipeline go through as usual and then add some digital logic that detects when a hazard has occurred 
Um, and only when it's actually occurred do you do something about it. You can then stop the pipeline. Again, think of a, a production line. It's like these Japanese car factories where someone rings a bell and it stops everything. The whole production line stops while you fix something. So you detect the hazards occurred, um, tell everyone to stop, go back and, and sort it out. So this is going to introduce a longer delay than the, the NOP approach, but it's going to happen less often because you only do this when the hazards actually occurred. In the, the stalling approach, you chuck these knops in every time a hazard could occur. Okay, then we get to the more fancy stuff. Um, we've talked in the history sections about Moore's Law and the way that we're now in this world where transistors continue getting smaller, at least for a bit longer. We can put more stuff on a chip, but we can't make it run any faster. So there's a economic motivation to try and make good use of more stuff. What, what can we do putting more digital logic to try and make things go faster? So one thing we can do is called eager execution. This is for dealing with branching hazards. When you have a branch, you can just copy the whole layout of a bunch of CPU components and you can execute both branches simultaneously. Okay, the pipeline is going to split into two and because we've got more silicon, more transistors, we can start executing both branches in very smooth pipelines. And then when the decision gets made from the, the control execution, um, then we kill off one of the branches and we let the, the correct branch continue running. Okay? So this, this is kind of gross from the point of view of resources. You're chucking twice as much silicon at it, uh, but it gives you a smooth pipeline and it's a good fit to the world we've been living in quite recently, where we like to have more silicon rather than clock speed. Then you get to really fancy stuff. Rather than executing both branches, you can try and predict which branch is going to be taken before it gets evaluated. Okay? When you see an if or a compare instruction coming in, you're somehow, by magic, going to predict whether the condition is going to be true before you've actually executed the, the condition evaluation, uh, which sounds impossible, right? But We'll, we'll look at some methods to try and approximate that. Um, this isn't always going to work. If it doesn't work, then you can stall and go, go back to the default option of, of chucking in the knops or redoing the work. And then there's a process called operand forwarding, which I'll, I'll give you some more details of. So how does this prediction process work then? How can we predict which way a, a compare instruction is going to go? Well, one of the most basic ways you can do this is just assume that the condition is true. It turns out most branches are taken. If you do a statistic analysis of machine code, um, most branches are taken. And this is because most branches occur in assembly code because they've been compiled from loops. Okay? If you write a program that's got one loop in it and one if statement, the loop is going to give rise to many more executions than the, the, the if statement, typically. So because these things come from loops, the loop is usually executed more than once, and that means usually we, we do take the branch. We do do the jump and go back to the beginning of the, the loop. So you can do pretty well just by assuming in your pipeline that every branch is, is taken. So, you know, less cleverly, you can use hints. There was a time when higher level languages would allow you to use keywords to specify, um, to specify a hint that a branch is likely to be taken or not taken. You, know, you could just, just put in an extra magic word next to your if statement and that, that will give the compiler a clue. The compiler will then go off and generate code that tells the CPU to start evaluating that branch early. What we've seen in the last few years are much more sophisticated, dynamic runtime predictions for branching. This is where you're running live code and there's logic on your CPU that is going to watch how the code's getting run. It's going to look for which parts of the code are often taking their branches and which are not. And it's going to remember what they did. So you might associate every location in memory that contains program with another value or a couple of other values saying, how many times have I run this piece of program before and what did it do? Yeah? And again, statistically, this tends to work. Statistically, if you took a bunch of branches on a particular line of code in the past, you'll probably 
tend to branch with the same statistics in the future. The last couple of years, um, especially with the AMD chips, we've started seeing machine learning methods get implemented at the hardware level now. There are neural networks in an AMD CPU that are there to watch the code going through and to try and learn and predict which, which types of line are going to take their branches or not take their branches. So again, this is all making your chip very complicated. These are things we can do with lots of silicon when we don't have much additional time. And it's being driven by the economics of Moore's law. OK, so the, the final hazard reduction method um, is called operand forwarding. And this again fits into the idea of using lots of silicon. In operand forwarding, we will allow different stages of the pipeline to peak at each other's incomplete results. Okay? So imagine, you know, here's the fetch unit, here's the, the decode unit, here's the execution unit. We're going to add extra wires between those units to enable stages further down the pipeline to get some hints from the previous stages about what they're doing. So by definition, those early stages haven't completed their calculations. They haven't actually added two numbers together yet. But you might be halfway through an addition. Think of a bunch of adders in your ALU. They all have clocks. Um, they're getting staged uh, by the clocks. And there could be ways that you can peek at partial results of that calculation to get some idea um, about what is going to happen. So if you've been doing adding in the workshops, you'll, you'll see how an adder works. You, have to build half adders and group them into adders and then have a bunch of adders to add the different bits and deal the carries. Imagine you, if you could peek at what some of the early stages of an addition were doing. And if it somehow gave you a clue that a number was looking big or small or likely to be bigger or greater than zero, that's going to help you um, making these, these branching decisions. This is going to give rise to very complex bits of digital logic now. So I think we from the work we've done in the workshops and from the last lecture, we could just about comprehend the structure of something like a 6502 CPU, if not actually be able to design one. You, you could, in, in principle, you could probably all design components of a system like that if you had enough time. But when you get to this kind of thing, it's getting very, very complicated now. You've got, every, you've got the pipeline, multiple things are happening at once, and now you've got peaking between the stages, lots of extra wires, lots of extra silicon and transistors getting laid down to do this. Lots of potential for things to go wrong in very subtle ways that may go in undetected for, for long periods of time. So that's pipelining. Okay? So pipelining is it's a basic form of what we call instruction level parallelism. It's parallel computing but still based on a sequential program like you find in an assembly language or machine code program. Um, a more recent development, which builds on the pipeline idea and extends it further, is called out-of-order execution. Um, in a pipeline, you have a, a linear sequence in which several steps of the instruction are, are happening together, but in a clear sequence. In out-of-order execution, we generalize this so you don't just have a linear sequence. You can have a, a tree structure called a data flow graph. And here, we, we have to do this in hardware. We have to consider the instructions coming in. So here you've got some machine code-like notation. This is saying a register, you know, take the value of register 4 divided by 7 and store it in register 1, and so on. We're going to analyze this machine code as it comes in and dynamically construct these data flow graphs. And the data flow graph shows you which instructions depend on which other instructions. Okay? So when we talked about data hazards, that's the problem that I'm going to write something to address 37 and you're going to read it and I need to have finished my write before you start your read, otherwise you get the wrong version of it. So we can build a complete graph of all these dependencies. So you see we've colored the, the register names in here. You can see, for example, instruction 2 depends on instruction 1 completing. Yeah? We have to compute the value of register 1 before we can do the addition in instruction 2. Okay? These are the kinds of instructions that would give you a problem in a, 
a basic pipeline because you could end up reading the old version of register one before the new one is ready. But we can do that with everything in a whole a sliding window of code. Maybe we're going to look uh, around 10 instructions into the code before it gets executed to do this analysis. Um, so we can see every instruction depends on the results of something before it, and we can turn those dependencies into a graph. Okay? So to actually perform this computation, you're really trying to compute instruction six. Okay? This is given by registers eight and four, and in turn, their values depend on other instructions. So this graph shows you which instructions need to execute before the next ones can take place. And once you have this graph, you can, rather than just have a, a sequential pipeline, you can have a whole bunch of things occurring in parallel. Because you can see, for example, instructions 1, 3, and 4 are completely independent of each other. It doesn't matter what order those three instructions are executed in. So I could take this code, and I could reorder it at the CPU level in any order I like to make things go faster. Okay? So this is the kind of approach you get in a, a basic compiler solution um, to data hazards, just looking for particular pairs of instructions that can be swapped around. But when we get to the data flow graph, we can actually compute a whole bunch of things in parallel. So in a case like this, we could replicate all of our CPU architecture three times, or a whole bunch of times, and if we identify three jobs that need doing, it's effectively like having three CPUs working on these, these instructions all at the same time. Okay? So this kind of architecture looks a lot like management scheduling. If you've ever made a Gantt chart for project management, when you have a resource of 10 people in a team and you're going to draw a big 2D chart showing who's going to do what at each time and what, what depends on what. It will work well for some styles of computation and not for others, so this probably doesn't help you much in a, um, an, anything with lots of dependencies and lots of checking. It, it will help you in something like multimedia decoding, for example, where nothing really depends on anything else. They can all be occurring through these separate streams. So in this particular case, let's see what the speed up looks like. If we were to execute this as a sequence of instructions, oh, in some cases, instructions take longer to execute than others as well. So we've shown register one, because this is a division, we're assuming division is a slow operation. Um, that might take more time. So if you were to execute this in sequence, this is how you do the jobs. Um, if you're pipelining, you get some speed up. You can do stages of these in parallel. But when you get to full out of order execution, you can do a whole bunch of things in parallel. So this is like a Gantt chart. We're saying, you know, this is job one. It's the slow division. But at the same time as doing that, we can have whole other areas of silicon that are independently doing the other computations, three and four and five. So this appeared on Intel Pentium chips in about the, the mid-1990s. Um, more recently, it's associated with an architecture called RISC-V that we'll talk more about later in the course, um, and a, an open source CPU design um, called the Berkeley Out of Order Machine, or BOOM. Try and imagine building this in Logic Sim again, OK? Again, you could just about hopefully build a 6502 style CPU now, but doing this is going to be very, very complicated. Normally, these are the kinds of things you would think of doing in software. If you were writing a, a management scheduling program, like Project Libra doing Gantt charts, it's that, that sort of calculation. But here we're talking about doing it at the hardware level. You're building this stuff out of logic gates to perform this type of analysis. Okay, so in the last part of the lecture, I'm going to hopefully quite quickly cover the infamous CISC versus RISC debate. Um, again, this is getting pretty tired now. It's a standard textbook topic. It was interesting in the 1990s. It's kind of resolved 
peacefully now, but people still use these terms to compare design strategies to di um, dif different ways of thinking about architecture and what, what the priorities should be. Um, CISC stands for Complex Instruction Set Computing, RISC is Reduced Instruction Set Computing. In a complex instruction set, as the name suggests, you are going to have an instruction set which is highly complex. You're going to have a lot of instructions. And if you think in terms of Babbage's analytic engine again, remember the simple machines, all these small machines in Babbage's ALU doing addition and multiplication and so on. In a, a CISC architecture, you, you're going to have a lot of those machines. You're going to have a lot of silicon doing lots of different operations, each with their own little piece of hardware. Um, the CISC philosophy also includes the notion of combining operations into single instructions, um, specifically the way it accesses memory. Um, we'll look at the details of this um, a little later on, but you can break down an addition into stages. You really, you have to do a fetch. You've got to get the two numbers in from memory. You're going to add them. You're going to write them back to memory. In a CISC in instruction set, you can bunch all of that stuff together into a single instruction that says just add the contents of these two memory locations together. Whereas in a RISC instruction set, you're going to split them into the more basic operations of bringing stuff in and doing the addition and writing it out again. Um, in a CISC architecture, you will typically have instructions which take more than one clock cycle to execute because you can effectively group operations together. You might have a very complex uh, mathematical instruction, you know, computing the square root even, um, which is going to take several clock ticks to do. That's going to impact your pipelining and your out-of-order execution. All that stuff gets harder when different operations take different lengths of time. And so typically a CISC program will look smaller than a RISC program because you have fewer instructions, but the instructions are, are doing more work. They're, they're more complex. So CISC is kind of a big industrial, big chip design kind of philosophy. And RISC is a, a lean and mean philosophy. RISC says you isolate everything down to the simplest possible instructions and then put all your effort and work into making those go as smoothly and efficiently as possible. CISC has historically been a more, can I say, American kind of industrial approach. They don't care so much about the beauty of the system. We talked right at the start of the module about modern architectures being like these, these buildings you get in Lincoln where there's you know, a 1960s concrete thing built on top of some Victorian red brick on top of a, a Roman settlement all cobbled together. Whereas risk, risk is more about beauty and elegance in, in design. Risk is the more perhaps English, British philosophy and more academic philosophy. It's very much associated with the company Arm here in the UK. You know, your, your CISC person is going to be a, a business person who needs their job doing by 3 o'clock the next day, and your, your risk person is probably the, the kind of person who, who learns Esperanto and buys shoes with toes in them and uses a Dvorak keyboard. It's about the, the beauty of the system rather than getting something done right now. So we'll look at the CISC philosophy first then. So CIS, CISC is the big architecture philosophy. We're going to have big chips, we're going to have thousands of instructions. This is the manual for your, your modern Intel chip or AMD chip. They're using the same instruction set pretty much. Um, five whole volumes full of instructions compared with the you know, 12 instructions, whatever we've seen in, in MARI. And there are going to be really specific, obscure instructions here, you know, things that are mathematical functions that are only used in one particular kind of video decoding, but they've built a hardware implementation of that to make it go fast. Um, this has been a good philosophy during this period of Moore's Law where we have lots of silicon and not much time because you can use your extra silicon to build specific machines that do all these really niche specialized tasks. The problem with it is that a lot of those instructions never really get used. 
in theory, your compiler writers are going to go off and figure out how to optimally turn C++ code into combinations of these 3,000 different instructions. It turns out it's really hard to do that. Um, compiler writing is hard. The back end of compiler writing is very hard, and thinking about optimizing them is even harder still. And studies seem to show that even in the most optimized compilers available, a lot of these carefully designed instructions are just not getting used in some cases at all. And you have these poor sys designers who've been hired to build this obscure multimedia decoding obstruction instruction for three years, and all their work's gone into this beautiful silicon thing, and then the compiler writers just never call it. And they, they make it all out of additions and multiplications instead. If you're a compiler writer, you like stuff to be portable. You're probably going to write a front end to your compiler that understands C++, and you're going to write several back ends that compile it into instructions for different processes. And your life's going to be a lot easier if all those processes have the same core set of instructions that you can chuck out back end stuff for. You really don't want to have 50 different processes all with 3,000 different instructions and have to worry about kicking out code for each one. So as an implementation of these complex instruction sets, the concept of microprogramming um, is crucial. So you don't have to do this. You could implement every Cisco architecture on raw silicon. The problem with building Cisco on raw silicon is debugging. We've seen how much it costs to create a chip. Even to produce one chip when you test it is $5 million project. Um, and you really don't want bugs to be creeping in at that level, because it's going to cost you $5 million every time you fix one bug in a hardware design. So this got kind of expensive with, with that approach. And so the microprogramming idea is we do some of this stuff at a software level inside the CPU. We're going to build a, a lower level computer, and it's going to have firmware that enables us to implement the higher level instructions. And when you change the firmware, you don't need to spend $5 million on a new set of masks. You only need to spend $5 million on the masks when you build the system that can implement firmware. So you're going to fix the bugs in the firmware level. And this idea actually goes right back to Babbage again. Um, the analytic engine was a microprogrammed architecture, and the idea was taken up by Morris Wilkes in 1951 and turned into electronics, and that's given us the, the modern CISC approach. What we saw in Babbage's machine, remember this is the control unit, it's the rotating barrel. Remember this goes round and round and it's triggering the stages, it's triggering the fetching and the decoding and the execution and, and everything else. But you can think of the firmware here as the configuration of the pins, just like configuring a musical barrel organ. You can take those pins out and put them in different places and you'll get a different kind of computer, um, triggering the components of the CPU in different orders. So there's a whole other level of programming here. This is the, the microprogram contained inside the CPU. And you can upgrade the microprogram in your CPU if a, a security bug is found. You can put new firmware on it, um, get the latest version. When you get really into this, you will see programs, microprograms written in what's called RTL, register transfer language. So this is how we explain what an individual instruction is actually doing. You can refer to the internal registers of the CPU. Remember, as well as the user accessible registers, there's all this other stuff. There's the MAR and the MBR, these, these things that are involved in moving data around between memory and the CPU. And you can break down something like a, a CISC addition. So CISC addition lets you pull in two numbers from memory, add them together, and put them out again. You can break that down into a microprogram that says, first of all, you put the memory locations in contact with these buffers in your CPU, and then you put the buffers in contact with the registers to get it in the registers, and then you put the registers in contact with the ALU, and then you tell the ALU to do this kind of operation, and then you write it back. Um, so RTL is used for, for writing microprograms. You can define a CISC instruction in terms of these much simpler steps. So in theory, you can create new CPUs just by rewiring the one you've already got. You could build some completely crazy 
research design and just upload it as firmware onto your, your Intel chip to test it out. If you know what all the components are that are available to you, you know what all the different bits of ALU are and you know what it is you want to wire, um, in practice it's probably quite tricky to do that. So the underlying philosophy of CISC then is as few lines of code as possible. CISC is from this argument is nice for users because they get to write short programs. If they want a square root doing, they can give a single assembly instruction saying do a square root. Some of these operations almost look like high level programming languages. You could imagine this growing and growing with more and more functionality getting put into individual instructions. Um, and the, the, the key characteristic of CISC then is this ability to merge memory access with operations. So for example, to do an addition or a multiplication, um, we're going to multiply values from these two bits of memory and a single instruction like this is going to pull them into registers, it's going to copy that into a register, that into a register, then it's going to add them, maybe the result goes in another register or maybe it overwrites one of the registers it was already using um, and then you might even store the result of that back into memory all in one go. So as a user, if you want to handwrite assembly code, this is arguably quite nice because you just call, call the multiplication operation. The CISC people argued then that it made life easier for compiler writers because they should do less work as well. If they have to implement a square root function in C++, all they have to do is translate it into a square root assembly instruction and they're done. Um, rather than translating it into a whole bunch of actual computations made out of addition and multiplication. So in practice, the compiler writers didn't like this so much because every processor had a different implementation of the square root and there wasn't a nice one-to-one -one mapping between C++ and each individual instruction set. They actually had to do a lot more work because they were translating into very different languages every time someone made a new processor. Um, there's this argument that the length of code is very short. Yeah, you know, you need to you devote less RAM to storing your instructions. Maybe there was a time this was more important than now. Today, memory is economically cheap, so it doesn't really matter if your program's twice as long. Um, that was an argument given for it. CISC is still dominant in real-world performance computing, as in the stuff on your desktop or stuff that is bigger than your desktop, like the, the data centers, the cloud computing. Um, it's associated with the brands Intel and AMD. Um, they have a complex history, which we'll look at later in the module, um, how these two companies evolved to be implementing the same instruction sets together. So it's, it's big. There's a lot of architecture. It's practical. It's ugly. It's, a, it's something that, that works in the real world, but is <coughs> liable to bugs. It's, it's ugly. Um, it depends on your use case. Do you want something that works by 3 o'clock tomorrow, or do you want something like shoes with, with toes in them? It's a philosophical issue. So the, the other philosophy, the shoes with toes in them philosophy, is risk. This is the reduced instruction set computing. And this takes completely the opposite approach. Where CISC is going off and implementing thousands of instructions, RISC is saying we're going to take a much smaller set and we're going to implement them really, really well. So this came about when Hennessy started the quantitative study of program execution. So he has a book called Computer Architecture, A Quantitative Approach, which is harder than the other textbooks recommended here, but it's the, the most advanced one. And his quantitative approach revolutionized thinking, which was at the time stuck in CISC world. He did studies of which instructions are actually being used. So they'd take banks of typical programs, compile them down, and see what, what actually happens. And as, as with many things in life, you get a kind of 90-10 rule. 10% um, of the instructions are doing 90% of the work. Um, there's a kind of exponential drop-off. You know, these really fancy instructions, like square roots and so on, are not really getting used at all in many cases. 
So the risk approach is you find the ones that are getting used, which are loading and storing and adding and multiplying and not, not these fancy things, and you make them go really, really fast. You do them simple and cleanly um, and efficiently. It's the lean and mean approach. So multiplication in risk, it does require a longer program, but the program's made out of simpler commands. Here's the same two numbers to be multiplied. And instead of having a single sysc instruction, we've now got four risk instructions. So we, we have to load each one individually. We do the arithmetic. So a characteristic of risk is that all arithmetic and similar operations are only done on registers. You always separate the loading and storing from the, the doing stuff. Um, and then you store the result at the end. So you can see you need more memory to store this program. There's Depending on your point of view, this program is simpler and more beautiful, or it's longer and therefore less beautiful than the, the Sysc program. Um, and again, depending on your point of view, the compiler has to perform more work. It has to perform more, <laughs> more writing of a text file to generate four instructions, but generating text files isn't really work. The compiler writer arguably has to do less work, because they don't have to wade through a five-volume book of Sysc instruction. But the big advantage is that part of the risk philosophy is each instruction should take exactly one clock cycle. And this, this means all instructions take the same time to execute. And this means that things like pipelining and now out of order execution are much, much simpler because every instruction takes the same block of time. It's easier to predict where things are going to fit in the pipeline. So you'll typically find pipelining and out of order execution go much more smoothly in a risk system. So you, you can still take a lot of silicon doing clever things. You could build a, an out-of-order execution engine, like the, the Berkeley Boom system. Out-of-order execution uses a lot of silicon, but you're using the silicon to, to do that smooth pipelining out-of-order execution rather than using up the same silicon to implement thousands of instructions that no one ever uses. If you've got a finite amount of silicon, you can choose one or the other. Do I want lots of instructions, or do I want to make my my execution goes smoothly all the time. At least until all the out-of-order execution stuff kicked off, this stuff was generally simpler. There were fewer places for bugs. It was easier to prove, to formally verify that things work. Um, and in particular, it has historically resulted in chips which are smaller and simpler, and they consume less power, which, of course, is critically important. Now we're moving to this world where computing is embedded and portable, and we're dealing with mobile phones and sensors in the Internet of Things. Um, and this is the reason that ARM, in particular, has become so dominant. Probably everyone here has got a little ARM chip in their pocket, which is a RISC chip. ARM used to stand for Acorn Risk Machines. It was the same Acorn that created the BBC Micro that turned into ARM. I think they then redefined it as advanced risk machines, or probably now it doesn't officially stand for anything, but the heritage is still there, and the company's still based in Cambridge, and it's the major employer of computer architects in the UK, if anyone would like to go and work there when they graduate. Um, ARM is a proprietary company. It's not an open source instruction set. It's not an open source design. More recently, there's been a big open source hardware movement involved in this. Risk 5 we'll talk about later in the module, is a fully open sourced instruction set. It's not a chip design, it's a design for the instruction set um, coming from Berkeley. And it gets implemented both by proprietary companies and by fully open source projects. So the Berkeley out of order machine, that's the thing doing out of order execution, that's a fully, fully open source hardware design. For the first time, we've got a whole CPU that everything is open sourced. In, in, in theory, anyone could just go and build their own $5 billion fab plant and start producing these without having to pay a, a license fee. Um, so some of the companies involved in this are Sci-5 and Low Risk. Low Risk is also based in Cambridge. So Cambridge is quite an interesting place now. You've got the ARM people with their proprietary version of this, and Risk 5 and Low Risk are pretty much going head to head now. Uh, it's maybe the time that the ARM architecture is going to become less dominant, maybe replaced by the, the open source solution. So we've seen a bunch of modern developments in CPU design. We've, we were on the 1980s last time. Now we're 
almost up to the present time, we've seen that although as programmers we think in terms of sequential execution of programs, what's actually going on in there is much, much more complicated. You know, you're telling me that my computer takes my program and converts it to thousands of different instructions from a five volume set which no human being has ever read in full and then it messes with the order of the instructions this is out of order execution uh, it's going to tweak stuff around with these data flow diagrams it's going to execute parts of multiple instructions at once either in a pipeline or in a, an out of order execution system it can be passing incomplete results between instructions in, in operand forwarding. Things are peaking at each other. We're using machine learning to try and predict which way the branches are going. You've got a neural network looking at your if statements now. Um, and there's this secret microcode in there, getting firmware updates, and who, who knows what's running in the microcode. This stuff is so complex. Is, are we sure it actually works anymore? On the 6502, a human being can look at it and know that it works. On a modern Intel, processor, you have no chance. Um, are you sure this is all safe? The answer is no. This is why we currently have this open issue of CPU level bugs such as Meltdown and Spectra, which we'll talk about in the performance lecture of the module. Thank you. If you'd like to play some video games for your homework, I strongly recommend all of these. You'll, you'll learn more about assembly playing these games than you will from reading the books, I think.